Welcome back, guys. Again, this is Dr. Severin. In this unit, we'll discuss pulmonary pharmacology. So, um, again, the goal of you know pharmacology for PT education, I'm not expecting you to leave this lecture being able to prescribe medication that's not in our scope of practice. Um, and even in you know the states and the military, you're not prescribing cardiopulmonary medication. So it's not really something that we're going to ever be prescribing, likely. Um, but as we discussed in our cardiac pharmacology lecture, you need to know the implications of, of these medications because quite often your patients will have them. So we'll go over the basics of pharmacokinetics. We'll go over, again, some of the indications for pharmacological therapy for pulmonary issues. Um, and then we'll go over the most common medications or families of medications and some of the more uh, common general um, or uh, generic brands of these pulmonary medications. And then we'll go over some of the side effects. Um, we'll also spend a little bit of special consideration on smoking and cessation, which is, uh, while not a pharmacological strategy, it kind of falls within the same uh, sort of treatment kind of concept. So we'll, we'll dive in here. So the indications for any sort of pharmacological agent to treat pulmonary disease, um, probably the, the two biggest ones are gonna be to reduce bronchospasm and to reduce inflammation or the allergic reaction. Um, those are the, probably the most common ones you'll see for, for chronic usage. Now, obviously there are medications we can use to reduce mucus production, pharmacologic spectrants. Um, we can use medications to treat bacterial infections. Um, there's also medications to treat oxygenation, which again, oxygen, is a drug, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then we'll have some special considerations for cough suppressants and, again, smoking cessation. So uh, just a little review. So we're not going to dive too deep in the weeds here. We covered this enough in uh, pulmonary physiology. But the, you know, the autonomic control of airway diameter, so the sympathetic nervous system, causes bronchodilation by increasing the expression of cyclic AMP. Uh, when we have that happen, it facilitates smooth muscle relaxation an inhibition of the mast cells. Remember those mast cells from the pulmonary physiology lecture, the mast cells, when they're stimulated, right, they, they are the, uh, the drivers for the immune response. And the immune response can lead to more secretions, um, airway inflammation, they're the mediators for that. So if we inhibit them or decrease their ability to express themselves, um, we're gonna have less inflammation and less mucus uh, production. And then parasympathetics um, causes bronchoconstriction by inc increasing cyclic GNP, okay, uh, which facilitates smooth muscle constriction. Again, think of it again, you know, the sympathetic nervous system, we're talking about, you know, running away from that saber-toothed tiger. You know, the parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. We don't really need to draw in a lot of volume if we're kind of sitting down, right? We don't really need to ventilate too much. So we're going to, you know, constrict those airways down a little bit. And you can think of it more kind of bringing us back to our set point um, in, in most settings for the parasympathetic nervous system. Sorry about that. I'll make sure that's on silent. All right. So um, looking again just at how these are expressed, um, we've got, you know, again, cyclic EN, uh, AMP increasing the activity of that will lead to uh, dilation in the airways, okay? Um, and if we have decreased cyclic AMP, it leads to constriction or increased cyclic GNP, right, which are, you know, facilitated by these cholinergic uh, receptors here. Again, so without getting into too, too deep into the weeds here, um, you know, by facilitating more cyclic AMP, um, again, we can accomplish this by stimulating those beta-2 receptors, and we'll get into some of those, or glucocorticoids, right, our anti-inflammatories to you know, increase cyclic AMP, to cause airway dilation, decrease spasm, edema um, in the airways. So our primary route of administration for pulmonary medications is um, inhalation, aerosol. Um, it can be delivered orally as well. We have some, you know, we'll talk about some medication where you can see that Ventolin is a common one. Um, or IV in some situations as well. Um, if we want to have you know, rapid access or someone who doesn't have, um, you know, a, or has a obstructed upper airway, we can't get, you know, the medications to act on those uh, uh, airways by breathing in. So we can inject it through the IV. We'll talk about some situations where uh, that may be uh, used. Um, the two more common I guess instruments we'll see for air, you know, these inhaled medications or aerosolized medications are metered dosed inhalers or a dry powdered inhaler. Okay, so 
um, a dry powder inhaler. It doesn't use propellant, and it's like a really requires a really high flow rate. And we'll talk about uh, some medications that use a singular as an example of that. Um, but a meter dose inhaler has a propellant that pushes the medication when you puff it. Um, you're probably familiar with these, that you've seen anyone who use an inhaler. Uh, that's kind of the one we're referring to, an MBI, meter dose inhaler. Uh, the benefits of these medications are rapid delivery, absorption medication, very large surface area, and we're getting directly to the tissue we're working on, right? If we have pulmonary issues, you know, breathing in, um, you know, the medication to treat it is probably effective. We don't have to go through first pass metabolism. We're going right to the lungs. So, uh, you know, can be less uh, systemic effects as well. There, are, though, there are some. We'll get into those later. Uh, the limitations you, you, you can't really prescribe an exact dosage. A lot of that's dependent on inspiratory flow. So, uh, often in kids, um, they have trouble with this generating enough or, or consistent or accurate flow. Realistically, humans aren't able to maintain consistent flow, you know, breath per breath. Um, so you know, just just bear that in mind, you know, unless we're ventilating someone using a mechanical ventilator, our flow rates aren't going to be consistent. So there's always going to be a little bit different um, effect by how much we can take in, and that's always going to be dictated by how much we can breathe in, our flow rate, okay? Um, and it can be irritating the tissue as well, again, especially some of the, um, the propellant that's contained in a lot of these inhalers. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think if we look at the the most of your drugs, about 60 to 80 percent of the MBI of, the, of an MBI spray, the drug is actually propellant. Like very little is act, is actually the active drug. It's like one percent. Um, so just kind of bear that in mind. Uh, but again, the advantages since it gets to the um, you know right to the lungs, we don't have to use as much because like we're not having to go through that first pass uh, metabolism. Even though they might be you know some of it may get down into the GI tract. Um, if we, you know, we, you know, potentially, yeah. So some can be, you know, absorbed into the stomach with our, even with our MDIs, like a good bit gets swallowed, um, especially with kind of poor technique. Um, and 10 to 20 percent only gets to the lungs. But the, the advantage is, again, like we have to give, we can give much less dosages, right? Um, if we look again, the, the oral dosage that we have to give someone to get the same effect of a meter dose inhaler to act on the lungs. So if we compare you know, the, those, those amounts, we'd have to give 20 times the amount of medications in a pill or an oral delivery um, to act on the lungs if we take it through a, a you know, PO pill as we would with an inhaler. So even a, you know, a good bit still gets swallowed when we do an inhaler, the amount of medication is so much smaller um, that the effects um, are typically a little bit better, there may be less side effects than if we would to give someone a pill for the same medication. So that's why inhalers are so effective for patients with pulmonary disorders uh, because of um, how little, right, the, you know, the how little we have to give for an inhaled dose compared to a, um, an oral dose. And that goes back to the, the same first path metabolism that we talked about in the, you know, the cardiac pharmacology lecture. So again, reminder, even though we swallow a good bit um, you know, a good, you know, so a good enough amount gets to the lungs and we don't have to deliver as much because, um, the, 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 we're going right to the lungs. So we can give a much lower dosage. So even though some is going to you know, not go to the lungs, some is going to be swallowed. The effects are generally a little bit m less than it would be with an oral pill or PO medication because the amount of medication is so much lower. It doesn't have to be super high. All right, so let's just go over um, techniques. So again, it's good to understand these things because you're gonna have patients coming in your clinic and their inhaler technique may be all over the place. Um, I'll post a video for you, for you guys in the course. Um, it's from the CDC's website on how to how to use an inhaler. So the first thing patients should always do, because we're, again, we're talking about an aerosolized gas, is make sure that we're, we're puffing. We're shaking up our inhalers, getting up, like, building up enough pressure. If they've been sitting around for a while, it's good to shake them up, two to five seconds, remove the cap, and inspect the inhaler. It's a big thing with kids that their inhaler has been sitting in their book bag for a while and they take it to school. It could be a little like, gunky. Just make sure there's nothing like in it. Um, just you know, make sure it's clean because you're putting this in your mouth. Um, if the inhaler hasn't been used for a little while, uh, you're going to need to prime it. And priming it means uh, you take, you shake it up a little bit, you know, two to five seconds after you inspect it, and you press one to get one good um, bolster um, out. Right? It just kind of prepares uh, the medication to be pumped. So you give a, you know, a quick pump. Make sure that the, you know, the 
um, the the vice is working, right? It's gonna it's gonna uh, pressurize and push out that uh, medication effectively. Um, the general rule of thumb is if it's been sitting around for about 14 hours, you should give a primer uh, pump before you use it. Just make sure that that pump that you're breathing in is as effective as possible. Uh, the patient's going to breathe all the way out. Critical. Breathe all the way out. Empty as much air as you can. And then start breathing in slowly first and then inhale. You don't press and breathe in for a meter dose inhaler. It might be a little bit different for a, a crush pill. Um, or a dry, or sorry, a DPI, dry, um, sorry, a dry powder inhaler, a DPI, a little bit different. But for a meter dose inhaler, patient breathes all the way out, and as they breathe in, puff as you're breathing in. They keep breathing in as slowly and deeply as they can to really try to get all that medication into the lungs as possible. Hold their breath after it's you know they've taken a full breath in and count to about 10 seconds. Like let. Give it a little bit of time for that medication, that volume to get down to the lungs. And then wait about a minute before taking your next puff. This is really more for beta agonists. You can probably get, a, get around this a little bit with other types of medications. But for your beta agonist, uh, wait at least a month, uh, not a month, a minute. Um, the other thing is, too, if you are taking medications, um, you know, routinely, really, really any time you take an inhaler, you should rinse your mouth out. Uh, the propellants that, um, again, 85% of the drug canister um, aren't super good for your teeth. Um, so it's always going to rinse your mouth out. Just a little bit of water um, after you take your medication, uh, your inhaler, just, just to be um, uh, good there. Uh, so uh, spacers, you might see this given for kids. Again, meter dose inhalers are super dependent on inspiratory flow, even dry powder inhalers. Um, sometimes for kids, they uh, struggle with the technique. So a spacer basically is a holding chamber um, that slows the delivery of the medication so they can get a more effective uh, dosage. Again, dosage for inhalers is heavily dependent on how well you're able to breathe in, um, so if you, or just how much inspiratory flow you can generate. If you can't get generate a good flow, um, which kids struggle with, you, you, you might see them be given a spacer or someone with really long-standing uh, pulmonary disease. Um, so again, um, often used for kids um, you know, with, with you know, pulmonary ulcers. I used this myself when I was a, a really young child because um, I had asthma. Um, and then nebulizers. Nebulizers mix drugs um, into a fine mist. Uh, so it's usually saline and whatever they, you know, you mix that with whatever the drug is in this kind of chamber. Uh, chamber heats and vibrates and it creates kind of um, a vapor that the person breathes in. So uh, this is great for people who just can't get the inhaler technique, even if you use a, uh, a spacer, or if people with um, acute distress, like if they have like an asthma attack, um, and we talk about status asthmaticus or even just any asthma attack. Um, it's a way for us to deliver medications constantly. Um, so we're, we're getting in, um, you, know, uh, you know, a pretty good delivery of that medication. You might also see this used in the hospital um, when patients, you know, maybe uh, while they're ventilated or while they're you know, maybe, um, you know, we're trying to prepare them to mobilize through some cre secretions. We'll give them a nebulizer treatment to get those lungs kind of nice and, you know, um, opened up uh, prior to doing uh, you know, chest PT or airway clearance techniques, okay? Um, so uh, the original thought as well, too, we thought that this medication really got medica the meds really down and deep. That's kind of inconclusive. The, 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 really, the, the biggest benefit, again, is it's just it allows for constant delivery. Um, so again, an inhaler, you're talking about breathing in you know, one quick burst um, twice. Uh, with a nebulizer, it just runs for about 10 minutes. Uh, the advantage is, too, uh, for kids, like, you know, you can kind of hook them up to it, um, you know, maybe while you're doing other things. So um, I used to do this for my little brother um, twice a day, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty simple to do. And, uh, yeah, nebulizer treatments. So in the next um, setting, we'll get into some basics in terms of uh, medication types. Um, and these are, you know, again, just a review of all the delivery methods for uh, pulmonary medications.